Prominent Republicans leave the Colorado GOP after it picks an election denier to lead the party. To say I'm a proud Republican, I can't say it. Denver pays out more than a million dollars to protesters attacked by police. We sit down with the candidate for Denver mayor who says poverty is the root of the city's problems. You're the 17th mayoral candidate I've interviewed. You're the first to use the word poor. And the state promises to get tough with all the folks getting a free ride with expired plates and temp tags. I can hear some of you yelling at your TV, finally. That's tonight on Next. Denver police's handling of the 2020 social justice protest keeps costing the city money. Another $1.6 million in police brutality payouts approved today by city council. The 1.6 mil settles six lawsuits involving DPD, including two lawsuits from protesters who say that they were injured after they were shot in the face with rubber bullets. Volunteer medic Gabriel Schlo will receive a $575,000 settlement. He says a rubber bullet to the chin left him severely injured. He had reconstructive surgery. Protester named Mercy Thomas will get $500,000. She alleges Denver police officers shot her in the head with rubber bullets, knocking her unconscious, even though she had her hands in the air at the time. Cities paid out a string of these settlements for DPD's actions during the summer protests. Last March, federal jury awarded $14 million to 12 protesters for an excessive force lawsuit. The Elizabeth School Board is going to go from five members to two at its meeting tonight. Three of the board members are quitting. This is an interesting exercise in what happens when a conservative culture war issue arrives in a town where there's no real enemy to be attacked. Because all of the board members agreed that critical race theory should not be taught in Elizabeth schools, and it is not taught in Elizabeth schools. But two of the board members fixated on the issue, turned on the other three for not opposing critical race theory enough. Heather Booth and Rhonda Olson are now all that is left of the school board. The three other members have handed in their resignations. The ex-board members say that Booth and Olson are pushing these conspiracy theories about critical race theory on school staff. Booth and Olson say they are just sounding alarms. They don't want so-called liberal ideas in classrooms. Before the board members can further restrict the teaching of something that is not being taught there anyway, they are required to first find some new board members and then elect new board leadership. Is with a longtime anti-violence and civil rights activist running for Denver mayor. Terrence Roberts says that poverty is at the root of many of Denver's problems, from crime to homelessness to the housing crisis. I notice some of the candidates are nervous to talk about these things because you don't think of Denver as a city that is a poor city. You think of places like Philadelphia. You think of places like South Central Los Angeles or Watts or Compton. No, there's poverty here in Denver, and it's okay to say these things, especially if you want to be the, the, the CEO of the city. It's okay to be honest about what's affecting our constituency or how can you address an issue that you're afraid to talk about because you, you're you afraid to lose votes. Uh, it's okay to talk about the root causes of these issues. I'm not afraid to have that conversation. There are poor people in Denver. There's poverty in, in historical communities in Denver that are getting bowled over by development. That's the key issue of this election. You also talk about the idea of, of social housing where the city would get into developing properties as opposed to having a for-profit developer uh, do that. You've said that corporate greed has driven Denver into a housing crisis. Developers have had a field day in the city of Denver. I'm not against development. They're cramming through. I think we're like 38 projects dead just for downtown alone. If you see our permitting um, that has been passed for, for new builds, it, it, it's skyrocketed. So developers will be fine. I'm saying we need to focus more on public social housing, which will still have to be built by them. They just won't be owned by them. It will be owned by the constituency of Denver. Developers will be fine if Terrence Roberts is the mayor of Denver. They just won't be the main focus. And most of our development is circled around a conversation of affordable housing that people cannot afford. It, I think it's just a buzzword to keep developers busy. And if developers don't like me saying that, that, that's fine. One of the key issues in the race is crime and public safety. And you have said that Denver should reimagine the purpose of policing to focus on public safety instead of protecting private luxury. Can you give me some examples of how Denver is focused on, per, on protecting private luxury? Um, 
Uh, uh, a good example is the urban camping ban. <laughs> That's the perfect example. Um, we're just shuffling homeless people around because they're poor, they have nowhere to go, they're not getting counseling services properly because they have nowhere to sleep to let that counseling really absorb into their mind, into their psyche. Um, they're having to survive. This is a cold weather city and we're using our police force not to solve crimes, not to not to keep areas safe. We're using a, a, a large bulk of our police inventory and um, power to just push homeless people around shuffling from one place to another. In my full 25 minute conversation with Terrence Roberts, we also discussed whether Denver is ready to elect a mayor with a criminal history. And Roberts view that some other candidates in the race are running on ideas that he put forward. You can see all 17 mayoral candidate interviews on the next YouTube channel on inews.com. Terrence Roberts is one of the 11 candidates who qualified for our mayoral debate tomorrow night. It is two hours, live and commercial free at 7 p.m. on KTVD and streaming on 9 News Plus. 9 News commissioned a Survey USA poll of likely Denver voters with our partners at Colorado Politics, Denver Gazette, and MSU Denver. There are your 11 candidates polling between 2 and 5 percent. 5 percent is the leaders. They've been invited to debate and make their case to the majority of voters who remain undecided. A few prominent Republicans are leaving the party after the state GOP chose an election denier as their new chair over the weekend. Former state legislator Dave Williams says that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. And Williams claims without evidence that thousands of dead people voted in Colorado. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger looks at the impact of Colorado Republicans doubling down on election denial. When he ran for Congress, Dave Williams went to court to get his name printed on the ballot with a crude nickname, a literal middle finger to the president. He was not successful getting the nickname printed or running for Congress. But this weekend, he was picked as the new Republican Party chairman. We are the party that elected Donald J. Trump, and we are not going to apologize that, for that anymore. That is the reason KOA radio host Mandy Connell switched her party affiliation from Republican to unaffiliated. As much as I hold conservative ideals and values in many, many ways. I will not be a part of the cult of Trump anymore. Connell is one of 133 Republicans to switch their party affiliation since Saturday, nearly all of them to unaffiliated. Over the same three-day period one week earlier, 50 Republicans switched parties. To say I'm a proud Republican, I can't say it. Former CU Regent Sue Sharkey changed her affiliation from Republican to unaffiliated prior to this weekend. I will stand behind my principles all day long, but I will not stand behind a party I no longer believe in. Leaving the Republican Party but still standing for conservative values may hurt people like Sharkey and Connell more than the party. Ever since 2018, unaffiliated voters have been allowed to vote in primaries. They can choose to vote in either the Republican or Democratic primary, not both. The new GOP chair plans to fight that law. We must work to close the primaries so that only Republicans choose our Republican nominees. For Republicans leaving the Republican Party, they could be risking having a voice in future Republican nominees. I'm imagining that um, there will be people on a Republican primary ballot that I'm going to want to support. As of today, former Republicans like Sharkey can still vote in a Republican primary for now. Because I'm a stats nerd, three Republicans changed their party affiliation on Saturday. 99 so far today. As Mandy Connell mentioned on her show today, she didn't change her party affiliation on Saturday because the Secretary of State's website was down for upgrades, so it's possible that perhaps delayed some others. Mm -hmm. Unaffiliated voters are overwhelmingly the leading uh, uh, sect of Colorado voters, 46%. Not quite twice as much as Republican voters. If you double Republican voters, and subtract 100,000, that's where that math is. I feel like if you go back a couple of years ago, though, it was the folks on the far right who were threatening to leave, leave the party over who they picked or whatever else. I talked to former state Senator Kevin Grantham, who was Senate president. He's like, I'm not leaving the party right now. These, this side, the, the Trumpers, did not leave the party when they didn't like our leadership. They're gonna, every two years we pick a new leader. It could change again, ebbs and flows. I feel like perhaps the ebbs and flows aren't the same as they were decades ago, but he feels like, look, my values are going to be here and soon we'll have a leader that represents my values and maybe not these values. And I, I go back to a conversation we had here months ago where we were saying, you know what, maybe the next two to four years is not the worst time for Colorado Republicans to see, to test this experiment that ultra, super duper MAGA candidates can win because they're not going to win anything for the next two to four years. So why the heck not try something? I asked Grantham, doesn't that hurt the cause more? Like, then you're farther into the hole, perhaps, if people don't like it. 
he still thinks it's going to come back around. All right. We shall see if they have traded a shovel for a larger shovel. Marshall, thank you. Hey, want to thank you for the boost that you provided the nonprofit Street Fraternity. Your latest Word of Thanks microgiving campaign raised almost $18,000 for that team that works to keep young men safe from violence in neighborhoods along East Colfax in Denver and Aurora. Your microgiving campaigns have now raised more than $10.5 million for nonprofits across our state. And we're always looking for nominations for somebody that we've overlooked. You don't have to do anything fancy. Just, just drop me an email at next at 9news.com. Denver mayoral candidate Jim Walsh says he wants to make Denver a more worker-friendly city. This isn't just something that benefits low-income residents. It benefits all of us. Talk about his plan to tax higher earners more. And a story for all the next viewers sick of expired plates on the road. Colorado promises a crackdown. Next. We have reached the last of our 17 interviews with the candidates for Denver mayor. I'm proud of you for making it this far. It's been a long three weeks. Jim Walsh is a CU Denver political science professor who is looking to put some political theory into practice. So your goal is to turn Denver into the most worker-friendly city in the country. What does that mean for the workers? What does that mean for the employers? Well, what it means is that we won't have two Denvers. Right now we have two Denvers. We have those of us who can afford property, who have intergenerational wealth, and then we have folks who, who earn a wage and can't afford to buy property and are being driven out of the inner city core. So um, a city that's, that's worker friendly means that workers can afford to live in every neighborhood in the city. And there's economic diversity in our neighborhoods. That's something that benefits everyone, not just low income um, neighbors. What is within the power of the mayor of Denver to do to create that environment? Well, not everything, but the mayor does have symbolic power, so the minimum wage can be increased to more of a living wage. The value of the minimum wage has dropped tremendously since the 70s, so it doesn't hold nearly the value. It's not close to a living wage. No one can make a living on $15 an hour, and so um, people have to work two jobs, three jobs to do that. There's also universal basic income, which we discussed a little bit in the debate, and this is, this is not a pie-in-the-sky idea. This is an idea whose time has come. It's it's also known as guaranteed income, um, and it means that the lowest income residents, people who are at or near the poverty line and below, would have access to more resources. Is that something that you can do within the existing revenue structure of the city, or would you need a significant new source of revenue? You know, I'm not, I, I would need to look hard at those numbers, um, but I do think that there's lots of options for some of that revenue coming from the top of the economic ladder. So that could mean some of the corporate tax breaks that exist, it could mean um, small um, tax increases at the top, but again, the social benefits of a healthier community would, would vastly outweigh that. In my full 90-minute conversation with Jim Walsh, we discuss his concern that Colorado's current crackdown on low-level crimes will have unintended consequences, and his suggestion that Denver return land to the descendants of people who were wrongfully displaced from it. All of our interviews in the race for Denver mayor are on 9news.com and the U next YouTube channel. How are we doing? The Monday after daylight saving time begins. That sunrise coming at us a little later, 7:12, but the sunset a little later too. Loving that evening light. 7:04 is that sunset time for us, and so far so good across downtown. Lovely to see those blue skies. Some mild temperatures for us in the mid 50s this afternoon across the metro area, eastern Colorado. 30s and 40s up in the high country. Pretty nice conditions out there. No major storms just yet, anyway. Tonight we'll be looking at partly cloudy skies. Temperatures still pretty good in the lower 30s. Tomorrow the sunshine is back. We'll tack on another 10 degrees around here with highs sitting in the low to mid 60s for the metro area. Even warmer into southeastern Colorado with 30s and 40s up into the high country. This ridge of high pressure is around. That's going to keep us dry for the next couple of days. But look what is off to the Pacific Northwest. It'll take a deep dive into Colorado as we look ahead toward Wednesday into Thursday. And that storm system definitely going to be in business up into the mountains. You'll notice we have a winter storm watch that'll go into effect tomorrow evening and then continue all the way through Thursday for our northern mountains about 6 to 12 inches around the flat tops 9 to 18 for the San Juans around Telluride and then up there toward Crested Butte too. Look at this seven day forecast. It's going to be the warm before that storm system pushes in here to the metro area. I have 70 degrees coming your way on Wednesday. Now all eyes on Thursday for that rain snow mix. Accumulation looks to be less than a couple of inches by the evening and then St. Patrick's Day. A little bit of sunshine out there with your pot of gold but we will keep it cool for the weekend.
The state has a message for the folks still driving around with expired out-of-state tags. Time is up. Time. Pay up. One way or the other. That's next. Few things have been such a constant fixation for next viewers as all of the expired license plates and temp tags on the road. For years now, you've sent us emails and photos frustrated about the people who are clearly not paying their way to use our transportation system. Well, you will likely be delighted to hear what our Mark Salinger found out the state is planning. We came to this random parking lot in Denver in search of something that's really not too difficult to find. Expired license plates. When you keep an eye out for them, they seem to be everywhere. There are so many expired plates and tags in Denver, the city has issued 16,000 citations since the beginning of the year to cars parked on public streets. And now the penalties are increasing throughout the state. That you actually need to register your car and do it in a timely manner. Amanda Gonzalez is the clerk and recorder in Jefferson County. She says the new laws will make people pay if their tags are expired or they don't register their car quickly after moving to Colorado. Everybody needs to pay their fair share. You know, we have laws and regulations around licensing your vehicle for a reason. New Colorado residents now have to show proof of when they moved here. If they don't register within 90 days, they'll be responsible for bat taxes and a $25 fine each month they wait. It's part of a new bill that went into effect this month. The state DMV estimates 92,000 people move to Colorado every year and don't register their car here. And the penalties are also increasing for people with expired temporary tags. Drivers are now responsible for back taxes and up to a $100 late fee. We needed to find a different way upon which to uh, enforce the rules that we have. Democratic State Representative Alex Valdez sponsored the bill to change the penalties. The money goes to infrastructure projects. It's, it's a matter of making sure that Again, people aren't freeloading, which is, is what it is if you're trying to not um, pay registration fees. If not, cities like Denver are perfectly fine giving out hundreds of new citations every day. For next, I'm Mark Salinger. The only DMV we could find that has any sort of delay right now is Denver. They tell us that staffing could take four to six weeks to get a license plate, though they will issue extensions for temporary tags. Feedback tonight includes a note from Mexico and a much more fun way to make a selection in the mayor's race. Next. James drops into our feedback with the humble brag tonight. Uh, my wife and I now spend a lot of the winter in Baja Sur, Mexico. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, then he asks where we watch next every night with our Roku device. Okay, good. Mexico, he says, has legislated year-round standard time. No spring forward, no loss of sleep. I know this, so I looked it up during the commercial break. He's absolutely right. They did that last year. James, report back from Mexico on how this goes after a year or two. Maybe we'll take next on the road to visit you. And Keith writes in to say, I have the utmost confidence that the city of Denver will elect the worst mayor out of the bunch. Okay, that actually made me laugh. And we're always asking you about your favorites. You're going to vote for your favorite. But for real, who's the worst? Like if you've seen all, all 17 of our interviews and you had to pick somebody, who's the worst? I ask this because I'm petty and I want to know who you think is the worst. So let me know. I'll see you next time.